All right, welcome to the Blacklist Sessions. This is the podcast where we talk everything, music, business, and video, pretty much whatever comes up. And we have a really exciting guest today. I'm very excited uh, to meet Dimitri. How are you going? How are you? Uh, yeah, really good. Now, you're a very interesting uh, bloke. You've done a lot of great stuff with your life. Um, you're from Silver and Young Private Wealth. Is that correct? Yes, this is correct. Yes. Awesome. So, uh, I understand that you were born in Egypt. Is that right? Yes, I'm a Greek uh, born in Egypt. Uh, four generations uh, of uh, Greek parents. Something probably I would put it in uh, similar to Greek Australians. Uh, if you can relate to that, I'm sure uh, you or your listeners have uh, some Greek uh, Australians or Australians Greeks. So, uh, yes, we born in Cairo, uh, four generations from both sides. Um, and I went to a Greek school. Uh, finished high school uh, with a Greek curriculum. Uh, my first language is Greek. Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to be my second language, Arabic. Now it's English. And the third the language is Arabic. Wow, that's, that's pretty <laughs> impressive. I, I have uh, two languages myself. I can speak uh, English and I can speak Bogan. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, um, so yeah, you spent a lot of time over in Egypt and I um, understand you went to the University of Cairo. Yes. Yeah, and then um, and then you moved out to Australia. So yes. uh, when did you move out, out here? I moved uh, 30 years ago when I was uh, 29, uh, close to 30. Um, already I was uh, married. I had uh, three children, um, Alex, Angelo and Katerina. And uh, of course, uh, we came here to Australia as a whole family. I came six months before my family mm-hmm. just to establish a little bit myself, find a job, rent a place. And then six months later, uh, my wife, Irene, and the kids uh, followed me. Awesome. So uh, what do you think were some of the biggest challenges of migrating from Egypt and then coming to Australia? The biggest challenge is, of course, is the language barrier because mm. uh, I knew a little bit of English, but uh, probably could read and write uh, not in a bad level, but I could not really speak uh, very well. Plus the accent, the Aussie accent was a bit different what we taught at school. So for the first five years, I probably haven't read a Greek book or uh, listened to a Greek radio or a Greek newspaper, only English, because I realized that if I don't get the language just in a, in a proper uh, in a level that I couldn't communicate effectively, there is no chance for me to uh, assimilate and uh, and make a life in Australia. So mm-hmm. first problem was the language. The second thing is that when you migrate, you lose everything really you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, your a little bit of your culture, your family, your friends, everything is new, your driving license has to be renewed, mm. uh, everything um, everything is different and it's a bit of shock on the system. Of course, we knew that and uh, we accepted that and uh, when you leave your uh, uh, environment that you're very comfortable, of course, you understand it's going to happen all this. Uh, but. More or less, it's still shocking the system. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, yeah, there's a lot of different challenges that people wouldn't even consider, like the, the driving license thing. I would have just figured, oh, you know, <laughs> it'll be fine. But, uh, yeah, you have to go through the whole process and everything. So that's, that's uh, yeah, really interesting to hear. So um, you, you haven't always been in private wealth, though. <laughs> no. I, you know, when you come from overseas, uh, you need, and you have a qualification. I had a bachelor degree in veterinary science. Uh, and I practiced there as a veterinarian for five years, specializing in uh, chicken farms. So when you come here, I came as a migrant uh, with the with the thinking that uh, I will uh, qualify my degree and a practice here as a vet. Mm. Uh, this didn't happen uh, for many reasons. Uh, there's no reason now to uh, to be negative or uh, and, and do anything more than move on. And uh, so in the first three four years, it was just uh, trying to adjust to that to get my degree back, my education mm-hmm. to where I was. Then I realized I couldn't. So the second part of my list was something to do with finance so Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be a vet second one sorry first one I want to be an archaeologist yep Uh, but uh, because I'm a bit dyslectic uh, I didn't go there Uh, then I became a a vet which I really enjoyed and the third on the list was something to do with finance so I said let me try this and uh, destiny sometimes works in mysterious way um 
we open a newspaper and I think Sydney Morning Herald, my wife find a conversion course in Macquarie University. If you have a degree, you convert your degree by doing another degree. So mm -hmm. that's what I did. I applied to Macquarie University and uh, graduate diploma in accounting and a um, few years later, uh, I was a qualified accountant. Awesome. So that's a, it's a really interesting transition going from uh, from veterinary science over to uh, to accounting and uh, and financial planning. So, um, do you think there are any skills from uh, what you learned in uh, veterinary science that translated over to finance, or was it just completely different? No, no. I think there are a lot of skills. Plus, uh, don't I mean there is always you learn your skills uh, from your family setup, from your environment, for what experiences you have, and this is you always ready to apply to your new profession or to your need to the to the your new need and i give you an example i mean uh, my kids always worked in say from 14 15 years old say to mcdonald's and to different uh, hospitality uh, in hospitality area mm -hmm. they applied these skills when they are in the professions the same to me as a vet you have to analyze to take a history not to be pre-assessed before you have the 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 clues what is is the reason of the disease and what then you need to do. The same applies with accounting, the same applies with financial planning. You still have to take the case to see, okay, you come to me for a financial planning advice, where you are, what you want, it is really that what you want, is really where you are, you are better off, you are worse off, and then do a case and then treat the case. So it's a very, very similar stuff. It's just different uh, applications. Yeah, definitely. It's very interesting uh, to look at it that way and think, well, you know, you look, take a really holistic approach and, and take it uh, from that, that sort of perspective. It's really interesting. So um, you've gone into private wealth, but the first thing you did was uh, accounting. So what was the transition process like between accounting and financial planning? For those that um, aren't too familiar, like uh, what are some of the similarities? between the two and what are some of the differences? Uh, accounting is uh, probably um, a discipline that is uh, reactive uh, and what I'm saying reactive um, you need to lodge your tax returns so you need to do financial statements for your company, your trust, your family trust or your partnership and uh, so it's always a little bit reactive and then of course uh, you want to go to a business and you go to, a, you to go to business and you ask with your partner for example and you are going to conquer the world and so which way because we don't want to pay too much tax so we do it as a sole trader as a individual as a you know partnership as a company so the accountants work a little bit more compliance and uh, implementing the law financial planning on the other side it is when you really want to go to the next step to create wealth, uh, to consider your risk. Uh, your, say, for example, someone in your age, a young man, young man with a with a wife or a partner, one or two children, has a different risk to someone in your age mm. who has no girlfriend, no married, and uh, even the same job. They have different risk applies to the next five or 10 years. You are more vulnerable when you have little children than if you buy yourself. Mm. So financial planning is a bit more of uh, achieving your biggest goals, achieving your goals of your whole journey, not just one or two goals, is the journey. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. So uh, what are some of the people that you think really could benefit from financial planning? Look, everyone can benefit from financial planning provided they have a, they have the a bit of put a bit of thinking to understand and see what they want to achieve and unfortunately um, the people who are very young they don't think in the long term no they don't <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the people who are already close to retirement then they get panic and they said oh gosh i need to do something mm. i'm 55 or 60 or 45 and i'm retiring in 10 15 years what should i do uh, of course there is solution for both cases and anything in between but um probably the d determine the journey and then have a step or two or three or ten steps to achieve that journey really yeah, so it really is different for everyone and people should start to plan earlier rather than later. As soon as possible, it is better. I see clients that they started, say, 20 years old and already they have a 
thirty, forty thousand dollars uh, savings from McDonald's and Hungry Jacks and uh, and little jobs here and there, and um, and they just the question is okay, how can I put uh, my deposit for my home or for mm. my house, my investment? These people are going to be a lot far ahead of the other people that they ask these questions only they found the Mrs. or Mr. Perfect 10 years later and I said, ah, now, okay, we want to start a family, I'm 35. When you're 25, you already have a 10 years lead. So in retirement, they're going to be a lot easier to have a conversation. Okay, darling, when I'm retiring at 60, 65 or 70. Mm -hmm. um, and this is only we're talking about money. We don't talking about, uh, I mean, people love to work. So if you ask mm. a doctor, he, he never wants to retire, not because of the he, they make a lot of money not at all it is because they enjoy the interaction with the with the with the patients but uh, say a work in a mining uh, industry probably wants to retire earlier <laughs> than uh, than uh, than later yeah for sure so that's something you would take into account like whether someone wants to retire early or they're just happy to keep going absolutely the aim of uh, every interaction we have is uh, to put the client in the best probably taxable position uh, according to their needs then uh, of course to help them create wealth and preserve that wealth through risk mitigation who no, risk mitigation is a very very you know term so through mm. insurances so according to their need at that stage of their life and the third one is uh, to uh, help them articulate a plan that uh, if they decide to retire 10 to 15 years earlier they will be able. Now, if they do or don't, it's up to them. But it's not forcing because they don't have the money. It's because they just like to do what they do. Yeah, so really at the end of the day, it's uh, just generating financial freedom so that you have the choice to do whatever you like. Absolutely. And financial freedom, it's a, it's a very strong uh, proposition. The reason is strong proposition because it gives you the ability to do other things according to your values. Mm. Say, for example, if your value is to save the world, hypothetically or put it very broadly yeah. it gives you the freedom to try if your value is for example uh, I don't know to uh, to uh, to contribute to a research and development for a cancer uh, you know treatment for a particular cancer it gives you the freedom to dedicate funds or to dedicate time to do that if you have the skills of course yeah yeah that makes makes a lot of sense to be able to set yourself up first make sure that you've got your own life in order your own finances in order and then you can fix the world <laughs> and and don't i mean and um, the people who usually they forget is that these things that don't come in one day Mm. This is an ongoing process. You start as, less, as early as possible. You get the best team around you to advise you according to your level, of course, of uh, finance or financial interaction. Mm -hmm. So if you are a simple employee, you know, working and go to work nine to five, you don't have really complicated tax structures or, you know, tax saving scenarios compared if you are an entrepreneur or a, or a business owner. Definitely. Uh, so you scale that to whatever you have. And every time you change, you scale up or you scale down. And in between, you have to be constant that investment is one is not one transaction, it's a constant transaction, it's multiple transactions. You buy today, and you buy tomorrow, and after tomorrow, and you do this, and you protect your, your capital, and you protect your income, and you protect your life if you have children, for example, and you want to live behind, and you protect your business if you are a sole operator, or you are the main man of the business. Uh, so there's a lot of things you need to do constantly. But if you have the right team with you, and you have a little bit of uh, of uh, discipline to do this stuff. It's a very, very, very rewarding and a very um, expanding your knowledge and your uh, ability to implement this journey that you started when you were. 15 or 20. Yeah, well, that make, makes a lot of sense. So the average listener of this podcast is between 20 to 30, maybe just over 30. Let's say that they're on an average income, they make about 70 grand a year, and uh, they've got $100,000 saved up. And that's it's money that they can use to either buy things or they can invest. What would you suggest that the average person, uh, you know, if, let's say 25, uh, should do with that $100,000? Okay, first of all, we have to make a disclaimer. We cannot 
cannot give financial advice to anyone over mm. a broadcast, of course, because I don't know their circumstances and I don't know their personal situations. But hypothetically, John and Margaret, they're earning $100,000. They can consider a lot of things. Number one, what they want to do, and that's what I keep coming to the word journey and goals around journey, because if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to plan how to go there? Very true. So you need to determine that. Say, for example, primary residency. Some people, they have the need to own their house. I, as a migrant, my first thing, I wanted to own my house. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't own my house, I would go back to, Greek, to, uh, to Greece or to Egypt. Mm -hmm. The reason is I would go back to Greece is because I was middle class there. Mm -hmm. So I could always go back. The door was all, always open. So the first thing for me not to go back and stay here and, and, and ride the wave and, 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 and travel the journey, I knew for myself I needed to buy a property. Mm -hmm. This could maybe not apply to you or to another migrant who comes from another side of the world. So you need to determine what is your very important thing. Then second part is, of course, your income. We forget that the income is the most important part of doing anything else. Mm. And then what do you do with your income? Your budget. You do something with your income. Did you spend all of them? Do you want to live today and don't worry about tomorrow? Do you want to go, uh, for example, on a breakfast, $60 every Saturday with your girlfriend uh -huh. or your fiance or your wife because you feel rewarded of the hard work? This is a choice. It's nothing wrong. And who am I to criticize anyone? Mm. But if you want financially freedom, retire 10 to 15 years earlier and create wealth, oh well, you need to compromise a little bit of reward today for a future reward. So we need to determine that. Then you have $100,000. What do you do with this $100,000? You have to consider. Should I take a small loan and do an investment property? Should I buy my own home? Should I invest for a parcel of shares, whatever, because I want to achieve something else later on? So if you don't answer these questions, really you don't know what to do. And any answer, it is not, uh, it won't be good for the person. The reason is, it is the strategy that we usually advise, not mm -hmm. the tools. Everything else is the tool. If you buy property, is a tool. If you buy shares, is a tool. If you buy uh, an investment portfolio, is a tool. If you buy business, is a tool. A tool to what? To create and achieve your goal at your end of your journey and enjoy the journey also. So it's not just to achieve what you want to do. It's also enjoy the time between now and this magical 67, 80, 90, mm. which today, 67 is an illusion because most people live up to 92. So when we say retire 67, it is really uh, not much because you have another 30 years of productive life yeah. uh, after that, really. <laughs> well, but that's uh, it. So, yeah. so uh, that's, yeah, really interesting to put it that way. So the best thing would be for, for people to come and talk to someone like yourself and really explain their circumstances so they can get really quality advice. Absolutely. And and you don't need to take the advice and implement it 100%. Uh, the reason is uh, maybe they're not ready to implement it. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, they, uh, they have other things in life that they need to settle. Uh, for example, a young, a young couple, they want to get married and the priority for them is the wedding. So beyond that point uh, they need to do this point first and then plan for the future because i see a lot of couple they say oh look i'm marrying in six months time so mm -hmm. everything i save is there yep. everything i do is that so understand but it doesn't matter really but you put the 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 plan and you pave the wave the 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 path to achieve that and um and it takes some time, really. It takes mm. some time to, to think about. Uh, and the more the couple, if it's a couple, or the individual is determined what they want to achieve, the easier it is. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I guess what's... Uh, what's some of the things that you think have really helped to grow your own business? Because uh, you started a as a migrant coming out to a brand new country. Uh, what were what were some of the key things that you think have helped you to grow the business to where it is today? There is several things. So one uh, one of them is um, by doing multiple uh, tasks in a different uh, say. 
by working in a different uh, discipline, it's a, say working in a factory, working in um, in a county practice, uh, working as a vet, working in a different areas, you learn a lot of skills mm. and how to adapt to that skills. Secondly, I me personally, and I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this is the right the right for everyone. I don't judge the the book by its cover. Mm -hmm. So all the people who come to my office. I'll give the benefit that they want to be benefit to benefit from my uh, information and my knowledge and my experience, and I give 100%. Mm -hmm. Some of them they really don't do anything; they don't want to do anything. They just want to have a chat. Yep. But some of them they do. Um, the other thing is um, that hard work and discipline, uh, procedures, mm -hmm. um, commitment, uh, budgeting your expenses even in a business on your personal level not to exceed your income mm. uh, so you'll be more free to invest and reinvest in your business uh, and most of very important take advice mm. uh, because i know a little bit about this in that area but i don't know about law i don't know about other things mm -hmm. um, so take advice from people who are good what they do not they say that they're good what they do yeah i a lot of people i've seen that they take advice from uh, parents parents have the best intents i mean mm. who can who is going to love you more than your mom yeah there is no right. other person in the world is going to love you more than your mom and if you're lucky your dad and probably if they're not around your wife mm. and your kids so but a lot of times we take advice from mom or dad but mom and dad was not an entrepreneur as you are or you are not as hungry financially as you are also the values are different a little bit for what your mom's and dad values usually they're very similar but a lot of times are not that similar yeah well that's right and you know the the economy changes so fast like you go back maybe five years people would have laughed uh, at the fact that there's negative interest rates in the world people would have thought that Absolutely, was crazy yeah. so um, I guess it makes makes a lot of sense to be talking to people that are a doing what you want to do like I, I tend to listen to a lot of people that are, are really wealthy and have a great life um, because I want to make sure that that's where I'm headed um, so for me it's uh, it's really important to, to take advice from uh, people that are professionals in the field and have a really good insight into what's going on in the world in the field another very important factor is uh, which I mentioned before is to continuously invest Continuously invest in a small parcels. This gives you two, three uh, advantages. One, by continuously invest in a small uh, stuff that you understand, what it gives you gives you this exposure, gives you this exposure, and you uh, you you just uh, work with whatever you invest. If it is. Uh, a parcel of shares or if it is I don't know in your friend's business or your dad's business whatever it gives you a this exposure of learning secondly your mistakes because you invest small are small so you can learn from your mistakes and thirdly because you're thinking this way somehow the world attracts you know you, you attract this stuff to you and when you have in conversation in a barbecue conversation with people who know or even people who don't know, you just tune to this sort instead of not thinking about investing. I think only mm. work hard and save. And the other very important, of course, for younger generation, it is um, they concentrate, they, all of us, it doesn't matter what age, we concentrate for how much we're making. And we don't concentrate too much for how much we're spending. Mm. And this is very important because you see the bucket of money comes in has a big on, on the top opening the money to come in but there are little holes in the bottom of the bucket which is your rent mm -hmm. it is your personal expenses if you are a smoker your cigarettes if you have a you like a beer your beer in a pub every Saturday and Friday night um, so these little holes it takes a lot of water mm. without thinking a lot <laughs> of resources out so you have to think about this as well and this is very very important part for any um, wealth creation strategy definitely and i think that exactly that is what's led to australia having the biggest debt load in the entire world <laughs> it's crazy so um what do you think is the biggest financial mistake that so many people make the biggest financial mistake, I believe, uh, for the for, for many people that I came across, they want to do one big transaction, and mm -hmm. that's it. 
They want mm-hmm. to buy, say, a property, or they listen to uh, to uh, read a book and uh, multiple properties and multiple share portfolio, and uh, they do it all at once without mm-hmm. having the skills. Mm-hmm. I mean, to take advice, it's good mm-hmm. for people who know, but you need to develop the skills to evaluate this advice. You know, you can't take it because I came to your office or you came to my office and I look uh, half decent and I wear a nice uh, white shirt and with a tie and I look respectable. That's fine. Yep. But you need to evaluate what I say to you. You need to evaluate and understand what this advisor or this uh, person who helps you and guides you uh what he says makes sense to you and of course the other thing is that people do mistake is we have something we call as risk tolerance and risk appetite and i'll give you an example when i was younger i like sweets mm. so i could eat all the cakes a uh, cheesecakes and pavlovas of you know in a barbecue and i go out bed and i sleep like a baby this is 30 years ago but today I still have the same desire if you are invited to your barbecue and I eat all the pavlova, (laughs) but at night I can't tolerate the burning stuff of my stomach of too much sugar. So my risk uh, appetite, it is the same as was 20, 30 years ago, but my risk tolerance is different. So they need also to understand their risk tolerance and appetite. So Mm -hmm. if you don't understand your risk tolerance and appetite, you can't take risk more than you can cope. Mm. Because if you take the risk more than you can cope, then you react aggressively to anything. Say, if you put $100 on a BHP and BHP dropped 20%, you feel, oh God, I'm losing $20. Mm. $20. I'm losing my $20, so I need to do something. Maybe you need. Mm. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But you need to assess this risk before you do any investment. So I think this is one of the biggest mistakes that people go too hard without really understanding themselves first and have the education and they have the knowledge, enough knowledge to judge, not to be experts 100%, but to judge if what they do, it is work uh, according to their values and to the journey they want to have for their life. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess with investing, a lot of people do freak out when they see the the stock balance go down minus 10, you know, minus 20%. Oh gosh, what am I going to do? But uh, the way I I approach investing for myself is, hey, if I thought it was a good deal at 100, then it sure as hell is a good deal at 80. So I often um, spend a lot of time um, averaging down on costs if I find that the fundamentals of the business are still the same. Is uh, that's that you would advise to people? Absolutely. They- this is a very good uh, strategy average down uh, if it fits the, the whole uh, strategy for the person. Uh, if uh, the fundamentals are strong, of course, uh, average down, it's a very good strategy. And the other thing is, say for example, we have, a, say, $10,000 mm. and uh, we want to invest it in, in a parcel of share and we ear tag this $10,000 it is on a high risk and we're going to invest it in the share market or some stocks that we believe that are very good, say the top 50 of the Australian shares. Mm-hmm. Usually it makes more sense to invest them in a parcel, say every month or every two months and take it slowly, slowly. Because for example, if you bought Westpac today or yesterday was really down, three months ago was up mm. and in three months time i don't know maybe the bad news about the bank goes away or someone's resolved you'll be back again so yes you don't take the cheapest price but most likely you don't buy the most expensive price and if your long term it is say three to five years and longer then this is pays a lot of uh, benefits in the long run start instead of trying to pick up the bottoms and the and the troughs the bottoms and the and the tops and i can tell you very few people do it and if they do it everybody knows and if they don't do it, nobody knows because mm. they don't say it to anyone. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, it's pr- pretty much impossible to pick the top and pick the bottom. So, yeah, I guess just averaging down seems to be a great way to go. Um, so, uh, is there anything on the horizon in Australia economically that you think might be a bit of a problem uh, that might start to really filter through and affect the entire economy? I think one of the most... Uh, of course, this is a personal opinion and... Uh, I, I don't have all the facts and uh, all the information um, regarding uh, wages and wages growth. I think the wages growth is an issue. Mm-hmm. The wages growth is an issue, and I can feel it from, my, from our industry. or the financial industry, there is a lot of pressure 
to outsource to overseas. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, you say, for example, in our practice, I need to employ Jay, for example, uh, to be a, a, a senior or a junior accountant. But if I have a competitor in Philippines or in India or in Taiwan or in Laos or in Vietnam, which is they're very popular mm. with half of his wages, how is his wages going to grow? And how is going to buy more property? And how is going to buy more shares? And how is going to buy more uh, insurances for to protect his family? And how is going to do more things to the level? So I th to the standard of level, to the standard of living, um, th he wants to have. So yeah, I don't have the solution. Mm. I don't know, but I find that the job growth it is uh, really uh, very very tricky with the globalization of the whole world now. I mean. My wife is uh, an interpreter of uh, Greek uh, and English, and now it's very easy to get an interpreter from over over the network mm. and from the internet app work, for example, and get someone uh, to interpret a, a page. And then suddenly you are very much uh, in competition with the world. Is mm. this good? No, really, in the long run, because we are upskill and we're still smart country and we're still positive and we we had always this mm -hmm. somehow but um it is really a stress factor for the economy yeah definitely i i would really love to see australia start to innovate a lot more i think we've lost a lot of that to uh, overseas and i think if that could come back i think that could spur a lot of job job growth um in some industries that are quite challenging and really difficult to replicate because there's so many incredibly smart people in australia that have developed so many amazing things over the years i feel if uh, if maybe maybe the government private enterprise spent a little bit more money on the r d side um i think we could bring a lot of that back absolutely i have a family member uh in my very immediate family that he was very involved in uh research and development in uh in university in fiber optics and uh they cut government after government after government after government, the last three, four governments. They cut the R&D dramatically and the mm -hmm. universities cut. And so you could see uh, you, you, the person is a doctor, a PhD and a, a great researcher. He fills more files and more uh, documents to get a grant uh, so to continue his research and development. So what is the flow and effect to the Australian uh, development and at the end of the day we don't have a chance to ac to succeed if we're not smarter mm. I mean why Australians are the best farmers in the world plus New Zealanders why mm. because they did research and development because they innovated mm. not because they worked more hours at the end of the day you have 24 hours you can't compete of that it doesn't matter how hard work you are you can work only 24 hours the only thing you can compete is the most the more intelligent you are that's why we are the best farmers in the world the most efficient farmers in the world of course the americans coming back mm. but we live far beyond other countries why because of the research and development why because of the csro because of these big research houses that we had and we pay we get the dividends of 20 30 years ago of um of uh, research and development uh, in every aspect from agricultural for the for the technology um, the space uh, participation in the space with the with the man uh, walking on the moon and, mm. and so so many stories uh, great stories so uh, uh, absolutely you're right yeah definitely well it's been a uh, really interesting to have you on the podcast Thank today you. it's been a lot of great insight so before uh, we wrapped up i wanted to have a talk about the bees i okay. understand <laughs> you do a bit of beekeeping <laughs> Look, I always have a passion about uh, many things uh, related to animal uh, and uh, plants. So uh, I have uh, bees, yes, uh, I have a small farm uh, outside Sydney, uh, about two, three hours. And uh, I was trying to do something outside of the box and I couldn't find something. And so I thought, what about bees? Um, so which is not really outside of the box. Uh, other people have it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they're but mostly I in just, the box. <laughs> yeah, usually they are in the box. So um, I started the bee. I have a small apiary. Uh, it produces a little bit of uh, honey. And uh, the great thing about bees is that um, 
I don't know. I find it very interesting. I find mm. it very, uh, very rewarding, uh, and uh, very, very. They are really uh, the hard workers. I mean, uh, you know, you know, bees are really hard <laughs> work. They don't stop one minute. Yeah. And uh, and it is uh, good for the environment. Mm. It's very good for the environment. Uh, and now, when you start, you know, when you, st it's like when you buy a car. Say you buy, say, I don't know, a Holden, a Mazda. All the cars around you are Holden and Mazda, especially in the time before you buy. Now, I walk around my suburbs with my dog and th I see there's no enough bees in the flowers. There's no this, the, I, I notice. Yeah. <laughs> but before a few years ago, I didn't notice. So uh, bees is uh, very, very uh, easy. They really under stress themselves. So I yep. uh, always liked the, the subject. So. I did some courses uh, to learn more and I applied them and uh, it's very rewarding uh, and I I really uh, suggest uh, if someone has the time and the effort he likes to have to put the effort and the space uh, it's very rewarding. Awesome. Oh, I'm glad to see that someone's looking after the bees. <laughs> I think we need them. So, uh, yeah, Dimitri, thank you so much for coming on, on the thank podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been great great having you. So what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if, if, if uh, they want to fix their situation? The best uh, probably way is to call Silver Young Private Wealth or 9600-7760. Uh, ask for Dimitri or Earl. And um, if they mention your program, uh, the first hour is uh, free of charge. We don't charge anything. And uh, just is uh, a consultation and we have a chat for an hour. Uh, and we tell them what to bring with them. And uh, we take it from there. Yeah, sweet. Well, that sounds like a great deal. So if you mentioned the Blacklist Sessions uh, with Silver and Young, get on the phone with them. I'm sure you guys are on the internet as well. Absolutely. Silver and Young Private Wealth. Fantastic. So that's the best way to get in contact. I'm sure if you guys get on Google, you'll uh, you'll definitely find Silver and Young. So Dimitri, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening to the podcast. This has been the Blacklist Sessions. And uh, stay tuned. We've got a lot of really interesting guests coming up over the next uh, few weeks. So stay tuned.